speaker. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Joel Foss uh, from Northwestern, and he uh, does a lot of work um, in targeting memory networks uh, with TMS and looking forward to your presentation, Joel. Great. Uh, okay, yeah, so I'm going to talk about my laboratory's uh, work trying to affect episodic memory by targeting the hippocampal network with TMS. And um, I think the inclusion of this talk in the in the work seat, in the in this workshop is really kind of uh, to advance the idea of getting people to think about you know in terms of affecting higher order cognition and function what the appropriate target really is um, and I'll be advocating that it's uh, the, at the network level that we need to be considering our our targeting um, which leads to kind of consideration of uh, what methods are appropriate and how do we best measure concepts such as target engagement. And so I think uh, most people in the audience are probably familiar with the idea when you talk about episodic memory and it's in the network of hippocampus, um, that episodic memory ability it depends on the, the, the hippocampal, the hippocampus, this bilateral structural structure deep within the brain, as indicated by patients such as uh, HM who you know, experience uh, you know, permanent uh, amnesia after bilateral hippocampal destruction. Uh, but the hippocampus doesn't do this uh, job on its own. It's part of a well-connected structural network um, that's been defined for quite a number of years. And you can, you can measure this network based off of its anatomy. Um, you can also use uh, methods such as fMRI. Uh, so for instance, if you put a, a resting state fMRI seed in the hippocampus, you can map out its network. Some regions are sort of the core regions. They're areas that have direct projections into the hippocampus nearby in the medial aspects of the temporal lobes and the medial occipital parietal area. Um, and they have very strong connectivity, functional connectivity with the hippocampus. Other areas are a little bit more peripheral, like these out here on the, on the cortex and the parietal lobe. Um, and so the, kind of the gist of the studies I'm gonna be describing uh, is just using conventional TMS to try to engage this target. Now we should, we should know by now in the workshop that conventional TMS will induce essentially no electrical field whatsoever in the hippocampus. Um, but the question that I'm addressing is, well, what happens if you apply TMS to these accessible cortical targets, what is the effect on the overall network? Can you have a reliable and controllable effect on the network? And what does that do um, if you do have an effect to memory ability? And so you can, you can create a nice, robust uh, E-field. Uh, this is visualized with SimNibs out in the cortical target that, we're, that I'm going to be talking about in the parietal lobe, um, as, as indicated down here. And so the very first study we, we uh, we conducted in this vein, we went into each individual and identified uh, their hippocampal network. We put a anatomically based seed in the, hip, in the body of the left hippocampus, used resting state fMRI connectivity to identify the network of that target, found these spots. Um, of course, the network is broad, including some deeper areas that we could not target very well with, with conventional TMS, but these other lateral parietal areas that we could target, they're part of the network, we aimed at those areas in individual subjects and we delivered um, high uh, frequency, uh, 20 hertz TMS, 1600 pulses a day um, at, the, um, at the conventional motor threshold, 100% MT uh, intensity um, for five days straight, as you can see over here. Um, this is, uh, so we measured resting state connectivity of the network at baseline, measured people's episodic memory ability at baseline, I'll get to that more in a few minutes delivered stimulation for a number of days, sent people home, brought them back uh, 24 hours later, measured resting state connectivity again, measured episodic memory ability again, so we could see how receiving five days of stimulation changed resting state connectivity and episodic memory. Um, subjects also in a within subject design received sham stimulation, so it's just low intensity turned down so that the E-field as would be approximately five volts per meter over here at the same target. Um, we also included active uh, control groups where they got the same full intensity stimulation but applied to the primary motor cortex, which is an area outside of the hippocampal network, providing a, a network uh, targeting control. So in this original study, the main effect of stimulation, um, what's plotted up here in colorization, are the statistical values for the increase in resting state functional connectivity um, for stimulation relative uh, to sham. And so the effect of stimulation was to increase connectivity of the hippocampus um, with these areas of the hippocampal network. So these are all areas that had resting state connectivity with the hippocampus at baseline. 
the effect of stimulation was to increase that level of resting state connectivity relative to the increase associated with uh, receiving sham stimulation. Um, and so uh, it's kind of a, you know, a fairly robust and uh, specific effect. It's within the hippocampal network and not other areas of the brain. Um, and uh, an independent group, this is uh, work by a postdoc, Mike Freeberg and Eric Wasserman's lab, um, just finished a replication study where they ran our, our similar stimulation paradigm in an, in an independent group of subjects, reanalyzed our data and found very similar fMRI connectivity increases uh, for the, for the, essentially the same set of regions as we did in the original study. So um, surprising, but you know, fairly replicable kind of effect. Now, the interesting thing, so, and this is a kind of a core point that I want to emphasize for the rest of the talk is that, you know, we're, we're delivering stimulation out here to the parietal cortex. But we're trying to affect the network of the hippocampus. And so a real question is, what is the locus of the, of the effect at some level? Are we changing the way that the parietal cortex connects with the network? And therefore, when we measure at the hippocampus, it seems elevated simply because the whole network is increasing with the parietal cortex. Or is this really a hippocampal kind of specific or mediated uh, by the hippocampus kind of effect on connectivity? So to address that in this original study, what we did is we broke the brain up into a bunch of ROIs, about 100 or something of them. Um, and you can see those all, all those are the rows and the columns in this graph. What's shown in colorization is the pairwise connectivity increase um, due to stimulation relative to sham. So uh, hot colors right here uh, indicate a significant change in pairwise connectivity due to stimulation. Cool colors right here are not anti-correlations induced by stimulation, they're just nothing. So they're around zero. So no significant effect of stimulation at all. And what we did is we simply ordered this graph based off of how well connected a region was with the hippocampal target at baseline, i.e. the areas up here at the top are the areas of the core hippocampal network, the hippocampus and the nearby areas of the medial temporal lobe and, uh, and, uh, and medial parietal occipital area. And what you can see is that the effect of stimulation really scales quite nicely with how well connected an area is with the hippocampus to start off with before any stimulation is administered. Um, if you do exactly the same graph, but organize it instead based off of baseline connectivity with the stimulation target where we actually applied TMS, uh, you don't see this nice predictive relationship of uh, baseline connectivity with the effect of stimulation. And so it really does seem to be a hippocampal uh, and core, an effect that's mediated by the hippocampus and the core elements of the hippocampal network, those areas that are closer in connectivity space to start off with um, at baseline are the ones that change most significantly as a function of stimulation. You can see that nicely in the first data set and this exact same pattern um, was evident in the replication sample from Eric Wasserman's lab, um, showing that across both data sets, it's really these core regions that are, uh, whose connectivity change is, uh, is you know, driving, um, driving the effects of TMS applied to the cortical node of the network. We also looked at episodic memory ability. Um, so at baseline and after receiving stimulation, people perform this particular task where they memorize the associations between um, uh, faces and arbitrary words. And then later at a delay had to recall these face word associations. They only get it right if they experience recollection and they correctly verbally recall the word that was paired with the face at study. Uh, so it's a pretty hard task. Um, and they get a new set of faces and names at every assessment. So it's not about retention of this information. It's about new learning ability. Um, relative to baseline, stimulation causes a significant increase in performance. Sham uh, does not with significant difference between stimulation and sham. Um, and we replicated this memory enhancement using the exact same task um, in an independent sample. Just think that's reliable across at least a couple studies. And so to summarize the, you know, the, the, this, this study um, indicated that you know, these, the effects of stimulation applied to the cortex really followed the connectivity of the hippocampal network. And interestingly, there was a greater effect on the hippocampus and its strongest connectivity partners than there was on the stimulation site itself, which was, as you know, you know picked based off of its um, being a member of the hippocampal uh, of, of the hippocampal network. So it was the stimulation site was defined based off of its resting state fMRI connectivity with the hippocampus. 
Um, and this study overall provides direct evidence that functional connectivity of this network is associated with episodic memory ability, i.e., um, I think that if you want to, um, you know, this, this indicates that if you want to change a complex cognitive function like episodic memory, you really need to target and affect um, the network of the core regions that are responsible. Um, and so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about some of the replication studies or some of the conceptual replication studies we've run, but across a number of different studies using a very similar network targeting approach going after parietal areas based off of their connectivity with the hippocampus, you can look at recollection memory ability. And what's being going to be plotted here is the study's effect size, where uh, in the green direction is an enhancement of recollection memory, and then the red direction is an impairment of episodic memory. The original study is on top, and you can see across a variety of different studies that looked at effects of five-day stimulation and waited for 24 hours to look at the enhancement effect uh, versus studies that used a single session of stimulation and just looked in the immediate interval after stimulation was applied. A uh, very consistent kind of medium to large effect size of recollection enhancement across all the studies. Those ones that are underlined up here are ones that correspondingly showed effects on activity and functional connectivity of the hippocampus and the, and the core regions of the hippocampal network. Um, so uh, consistently across studies, you see episodic memory improvement um, going along with uh, increases in activity and connectivity of the hippocampus with the, with the core regions of the network. Um, and uh, postdoc uh, in my lab, Melissa Hebsher and I reviewed this evidence recently, if you're interested. Uh, now, this particular um, cartoon down here is showing the area that we stimulated in most of these studies, the parietal cortex. Um, in the, um, in the cross out areas, these are all the different regions that were used as controls in, in the different studies that did not have effects on memory. You know, and so what this suggests is that really you know, defining and targeting the network um, based off of, at some level its anatomy um, is, is useful in having an effect on, on memory ability. Um, and so now what I wanna do is pivot and talk about a different property of the network other than just its physical location um, that might be important for controlling it with uh, non-invasive brain stimulation. And so the hippocampus is, uh, is, uh, uni is fairly unique in generating this very um, kind of uh, striking pattern of activity um, at, both at rest and during tasks, um, the theta nested gamma pattern where, um, where uh, that you get spiking activity in the gamma range in a, in a theta, um, nested on a theta cycle. So approximately four to eight hertz, you get these bursts of gamma activity in the hippocampus. Um, interestingly, and so this is mainly observed in rodents, but can be observed in human uh, subjects getting uh, you know, depth electrode recordings from the hippocampus. Um, similarly, if you look at uh, what's driving connectivity among regions of the hippocampal network, this is uh, data from Brett Foster's lab, um, they, uh, they find that different regions of the hippocampal network here, um, you know, medial temporal to medial parietal areas, couple in the theta band. So they, they phase lock at theta frequencies, particularly when people are engaged in episodic memory tasks, suggesting that really this, this rhythm is, uh, is a signal of network communication important for memory. And so we hypothesized, um, you know, wanted to answer the question of whether stimulation applied using this theta nested gamma rhythm, essentially theta burst stimulation, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, whether that would have a greater impact on the network and episodic memory than stimulation at other rhythms. Um, and we, we've tested this in a variety of ways. The first study we did to, to test this idea, um, subjects had a single session of TMS applied to a parietal target based off of its connectivity with hippocampus. Um, individuals went, underwent four different sessions in counterbalanced order, and one they got a low intensity sham, and another one they got beta, so 20 hertz stimulation of that target, another one they got intermittent theta burst stimulation, and another they got continuous theta burst stimulation for 40 seconds. Intermittent was broken up with, with uh, I think, eight seconds between the two second bursts of, uh, of two, two second theta burst uh, trains. And so the, you know, the hypothesis that we had going into this kind of counter to the idea that these stimulations might, the stimulation types might have different inhibitory versus excitatory effects on the brain. Um, our hypothesis going in was that theta burst would, continuous theta burst would really be the one to drive memory effects in this network because it would be best be able to entrain the network's theta rhythm because you're applying theta, the theta burst uh, pattern for a very long period of time um, relative to the other um, stimulation types which would uh, less effectively, um, you know, in, uh, 
you know, hit this, this rhythm of the hippocampal network. And that's what we found in behavior. So when we looked at the after effects of stimulation on recognition memory ability is measured here by discrimination sensitivity and the recognition memory task, only theta, only continuous theta burst stimulation improved uh, memory relative to sham. You kind of see this, uh, this trend where beta frequency versus, versus sham is doing a little bit for memory, uh, broken up or intermittent theta burst does a little bit more and continuous theta burst does the most. Certainly it's not the case that these are causing opposite effects as you might expect if continuous theta burst versus intermittent or beta frequency were having different inhibitory versus excitatory like effects on the brain. Really they're all showing similar directions of effects with just the largest one being uh, for the continuous theta burst condition. Um, likewise, continuous data burst was the only condition to significantly increase memory related connectivity of the hippocampus with the rest of the default mode of, of, with the rest of the hippocampal network. And you can see that colorized over here. The other condition simply did not increase hippocampal connectivity related to memory. Um, and it was significantly greater for theta burst versus uh, uh, continuous theta burst versus the connectivity changes you see and with the non significant connectivity changes in the other con conditions. Um, so this provides some evidence. You know, again, that uh, that really hitting the network at at, an, at a preferred frequency is ideal for creating in just a single session a network level connectivity change um, for the for the targeted regions related to episodic memory performance. Now, uh, I'm going to present a little bit of modeling data because we're in a modeling workshop after all. So, um, this particular study we delivered TMS for 20 minutes immediately pop people into the MRI scanner and then immediately after their scan gave them their episodic memory ta uh, test uh, where the performance is indicated up here. And so this gave us, uh, I'll highlight for this particular study, um, the uh, results uh, from e-field modeling that we, that we tried in this data set. And so what we did uh, for this is we uh, calculated the uh, voxel-wise e-field intensity using SIMNIBs. And then we looked uh, voxel at the voxel-wise effect of stimulation on connectivity, measuring using the value of connectedness, which is essentially for each voxel, how well connected is it to all the other voxels in the brain. And we looked at this area around the stimulated region where the E-field is most intense. And so we wanted to see what is the voxel-wise relationship between delivering stimulation, uh, between stimulation intensity and the effect on resting state fMRI connectivity. Um, what we found for the continuous data burst condition, now keep in mind this is the condition that significantly increased hippocampal uh, connectivity with its network and improved memory performance. Um, we found that the higher the E-field voxel-wise, the more disconnected uh, voxel became with the rest of the brain in this area of the parietal cortex that was stimulated. Um, and interestingly, if, when we looked at 20 hertz beta frequency stimulation, this is a, fact that, uh, a condition that did not affect the hippocampal network, we saw exactly the same relationship where the higher the intensity, the more of a local uh, effect there was on disconnecting the region. Um, and so what this, we found similar sorts of things that I'm not gonna get into for our multi-day stimulation studies, um, but overall what this seems to suggest is that for two different rhythms that have different effects on the core hippocampal network, the local effect seems to simply be disruptive and scales with the E-field intensity. Um, and we have not found in these studies or any other study any relationship between the local E-field intensity and the downstream effect on the hippocampus. It's predicted by its connectivity and by its rhythm, but hasn't been related to the, to the maximum intensity of the E-field at the stimulation site in the studies we've run so far at least, um, suggesting kind of this disconnect where you know, you can, uh, the immediate effects of TMS seem to be disruptive, kind of, kind of cutting a region off from the rest of the brain in terms of its connectivity, whereas the downstream effects are quite different and predicted by different factors other than just the E-field intensity of the stimulated uh, piece of cortex. To more directly observe the effect on the network, we have started uh, doing this during uh, concurrent fMRI scanning. So one of my graduate students, Molly Hermiller, spent the last uh, few years getting concurrent theta burst stimulation to work during simultaneous fMRI scanning. I'm not going to go into all the details, but just show you the results from one of the first experiments where we actually got uh, memory-related data using this method. Um, what we did for this particular study is we gave people different kinds of visual stimuli, so either complex scenes. Scenes are a, a visual stimulus category that the hippocampus loves, and it activates quite robustly to. 
uh, versus numeric digits that people make odd even judgments to, which the hippocampus simply does not care about. You're not going to remember those forever, and, uh, and the hippocampus doesn't really activate to them. We give different stimulation conditions for two seconds immediately before visual stimulus onset. Um, the different stimulation conditions were either uh, theta burst for two seconds, uh, which we thought would affect the hippocampal network, versus beta frequency, so 13 and a half hertz, low beta stimulation for two seconds, the same exact number of pulses applied at the same exact intensity to approximately the same location with a little bit of fudge because there's a, you know, a bit of movement inside the MRI scanner. Um, and we did this um, at either on or off for these different conditions. And we targeted either parietal areas based off of their hippocampal connectivity um, versus control locations out of network in the supplementary motor area over here. Um, using a within subjects design where everybody got uh, got all four conditions, you know, theta, beta, hippocampal targeted, control location targeted. The uh, the rationale is that if you entrain different different theta populations within the hippocampus, and so they're all in phase synchrony with one another, then when you show the hippocampus a stimulus that it cares about, like a complex scene, um, they're, they're, that's going to elicit an evoked response when these populations are most excitable. And that's going to be temporally aligned, so you should get the biggest net response um, in the hippocampus for this condition. Um, versus if you show someone some numbers, even if you entrain the theta populations in the hippocampus, it won't care and won't generate an evoked response to numbers. Whereas if you fail to entrain um, and things are out of phase, you're going to show a stimulus that the hippocampus likes, but its evoked response is going to be not temporally aligned, and so it's going to be weaker because it's spread out in time, and it's still not going to care about numbers. And so our hypothesis was that only the theta burst condition targeting the hippocampal network would cause this kind of entrainment, so it would lead to a larger net response to scenes, um, not to number stimuli. Um, we targeted, again, the left hippocampus based off its connectivity to the left parietal cortex. And what you can see here is that for all stimulation conditions, um, the hippocampus really did not uh, evoke any response uh, to numeric digits. Um, but it did evoke responses to the visual scenes that it cares about, and in particular, the hippocampal, the theta burst condition targeting the hippocampal network increased that evoked response to scenes relative to all other conditions in the left hippocampus. There's a numeric trend for the same thing, but not significant in the right non-targeted sort of control hippocampus over here, which could be due to the fact that there are connections between the sides of the hippocampus via the commissure. Um, but nonetheless, you know, this suggests that, and, and these trial types were all intermixed with one another uh, during encoding. And so, um, you know, it's not as though there are some block scenes and some with numbers. Somebody, yeah, I can't tell, sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, we also looked at memory ability for these scenes that they studied uh, in a subsequent memory task. Um, at focusing on the recollection responses that are that reflect hippocampal dependent episodic memory and corresponding to the effects on hippocampal activity the, con the theta burst condition targeting the hippocampal network was the only condition to improve recollection memory of the scenes that they that they um, that they studied uh, while they were there and so this this sort of uh, this evidence directly supports the importance of uh, the theta rhythm uh, for human hippocampal memory encoding and suggests that theta relative to the control stimulation conditions is kind of uh, preferential in its ability to have an immediate and indirect impact on a downstream target, um, the hippocampus. Um, and the, the final study I'm gonna run through, uh, run through briefly tries to extend the same frequency specificity idea to another node of the hippocampal network. So I've been focusing so far entirely on the uh, parietal cortex um, but as you might know, and you'll hear a lot about in the next talk by Mark Halko, uh, another region that is well connected with almost all cortical networks is the cerebellum. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to do in a particular study was to try to determine if there was a functionally related frequency specific um, effect of stimulation on a node of the cerebellum that we can stimulate that has mixed selectivity for both the episodic memory network, the hippocampal network that I've been talking about, um, but is also you know, well connected to other cognitive networks and might um, and stimulation applied at different frequencies to that node uh, might have different effects on those other kinds of, of functional outcomes. And so what we did is we targeted uh, approximately the lateral cerebellum around CRUS1 of uh, using either theta burst stimulation or beta frequency 20 hertz stimulation 
um, at, a, at the same number of pulses and same pulse intensity. Subjects also got a control location stimulation nearby in the occipital cortex, so it felt about the same, but it was outside of the network. And then they did a blended task where we gave them wor a word memory and coding task, which would, should, uh, should be, you know, depend on the hippocampal network, and we thought would be affected by the theta burst uh, rhythm that preferentially should affect that hippocampal, uh, that hippocampal network. Uh, versus a different task, which is a linguistic or a, a, a semantic prediction task, an N400 based ERP task um, that's more sensitive to the frontal parietal uh, language network uh, that supports language and linguistic prediction. And there's some evidence it's more related to activity at 20 hertz during task performance and so, or in the beta frequency range um, during task performance. And so the idea was that these different stimulation frequencies applied to the same exact location could might have different functional effects on these different sort of gold standard uh, functional assays of distinct large scale cortical cerebellar networks. Um, and so for the N400 task, they simply see, read a sentence that has either a predictable ending or a sentence ending that's logical but not particularly predictable. So Mark hates raw fish, so he refuses to eat sushi. It's highly predictable versus it's common to use your hands uh, to eat sushi. It's not very predictable because it could be hamburger or hot dog or anything else. Um, and so, um, and you can look at the ERP response. The N400 ERP uh, is differentiates high versus low predictability sentences and it is a very common marker of this linguistic prediction ability. And what we found is that, uh, you know, uh, corresponding with our hypotheses going in is that really beta frequency stimulation um, had an effect on increasing the amplitude of the N400 response, but did not do anything. But uh, theta burst stimulation to the exact same spot did not do anything to the N400 uh, amplitude significantly. In contrast, recognition memory um, was sensitive to theta burst stimulation of the exact same spot, increasing recognition memory um, compared to control location and beta frequency stimulation. Um, and if you look at the, um, the effect sizes for the ERP correlates of these two different things, what you see is this, um, you know, you can see that, you know, cerebellar beta frequency stimulation had a nice effect on the N400 ERP, um, whereas theta burst stimulation in the same spot does, did not. And you see exactly the opposite thing going on um, with, with, uh, with uh, memory-related signals. And so uh, what this suggests is that there's really kind of a doubled association of the cerebellum's involvement in memory versus uh, linguistic prediction processing um, based off of the frequency with which stimulation is applied to exactly the same area. And so to summarize everything, I think that uh, TMS in particular can be used to test the hippocampal network role in memory and other complex cognitive functions. Um, but this requires careful consideration of how TMS affects the network uh, which is really kind of the unit of, uh, of targeting, uh, and how this might relate to the processing demands of the task of interest. Um, the findings I've talked about provide direct evidence for the importance of hippocampal network functional connectivity for episodic memory, and in particular for the role of the theta rhythm in this functional connectivity for memory. And we have a little bit of evidence that's very preliminary that there could be some potential clinical utility to all of this um, in age-related memory impairment. So in a, in a study I didn't talk about, we brought in a group of older adults and found a lasting improvement in their recollection ability, bringing them to the level of young adults performing the same exact task based off of the parietal targeting uh, multi-day TMS um, uh, uh, protocol. Uh, but a lot of further refinement is needed to turn that into anything that could actually be uh, useful. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, my laboratory and particularly the people who uh, ran a lot of the studies I talked about are grad student Molly Hermiller over here um, and a postdoc Shruti Dave who's right over here and our uh, collaborators and funding agencies and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Joe, for a great talk. We have a number of questions and uh, let's start with um, how you define the target for your TMS stimulation. In particular, how do you manage the anti-correlations? If you have them, do you take absolute value of correlation? Do you exclude anti-correlations? Um, we, when, in, in all of our studies, when we plot a seed in the hippocampus and look in the parietal cortex, it's by and large a positive connectivity effect. We don't, do, we don't regress out the global mean signal or other things like that. And so it, it, typically the, you know, the connectivity networks that we see are all positive throughout the parietal lobe. And we just pick the maximum positivity within an anatomically defined ROI 
of the angular gyrus, inferior parietal lobule, and uh, that's it. Okay. Next question. Uh, how do you think how important is uh, focality or spatial precision when you stimulate? Do you think if you would treat broader area around the average parietal cortex that would uh, yeah, do we, a problem? This isn't ready for prime time quite yet. And so this is something we've been individualizing this in all of our studies because we went into it thinking that's the best way to go. And it worked. And so we've been doing it and haven't really wanted to spend the resources to test out, well, what if we just picked an average target instead? Would we fail to see these effects? Uh, we do have one study that we just completed with a slightly different focus where we picked a different spot, um, not quite one centimeter away from each individual's hotspot. In fact, it was their hotspot for a different network, the anterior temporal lobe kind of language related uh, network that is disrupted by PPA related atrophy. So we used the, um, a combination of the of the temporal pole and the and the uh, left IFG to define a connectivity network and picked a target nearby our hippocampal parietal target only about one centimeter away and when we did that we failed to get an effect on memory um, even though it's less than a centimeter away whereas when we had their actual individual hippocampal target we did get an effect on memory using the same kinds of tasks and so I I think it is actually important um, and it could be quite precise you know, <laughs> in terms of, of how close you need to be in order to have an intended effect on a network. Interesting. Okay, next question. Um, when hippocamp while hippocampus is activated indirectly as part of the network, why it's more active or as active as the stimulated area itself? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And it, I've, one thing I've always wondered is how uh, specific these kinds of network targeting effects are to the hippocampal network. You know, the, and overall, you know, it's, it's uh, not unlike some of the data suggesting that, you know, for instance, when you stimulate the DLPFC, the locus of the antidepressant effect has more to do with the subgenual ACC, again, suggesting that, you know, really it's the effect on the indirect target that matters in terms of function. Um, but, um, you know, I will say that, you know, the hippocampus is really a plasticity structure. When you induce LTP just within the hippocampus and the rodent, you get a network wide connectivity increase. And, you know, even though the parietal area that we're targeting is, uh, has connectivity to the network, it, it is a fairly sort of indirect, um, or a fairly weak participant within the hippocampal network compared to the more core areas in the medial parietal and medial occipital area, you know, uh, medial temporal uh, regions. And so, um, you know, it, it might be specific to the hippocampal network that we're really using a window to indirectly affect an area that has a high capacity for plasticity, um, or similar principles could apply to other networks as well. I don't really know. Um, okay. Um, you show a lot of results how we can improve uh, cognitive function by stimulating this network. Do you think you can specifically disrupt cognitive function by stimulating hippocampal network? Well, we haven't really tried to, um, but, I, 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 but I imagine you could. And in fact, there are quite a number of studies showing that stimulation of exactly the same region almost can have a disruptive effect. Um, and what you tend to, and uh, I, I didn't go into this, but this is reviewed in that review paper I talked about a little bit in current opinions. Uh, um, the, um, the kind of feature of the tasks that are disrupted is that they involve a strong component of the parietal cortex in their in task performance. And so they involve um, things like, um, you know, uh, projecting yourself into your memory, vividly relieve, reliving details, um, and uh, viewing memories from different spatial uh, perspectives and things like that. These are all kind of parietally mediated functions, which seem to be disrupted, much like we see a connectivity decrease in the parietal area um, I think that any memory ability that has a strong parietal component is going to get negatively disrupted, at least in the immediate sense, um, by, by TMS to the parietal lobe. I think that the local effect of stimulation will almost always be disruptive because it is a non-physiological intense stimulus um, that, should, you know, that should disrupt capacity for information processing, whereas the downstream effects are, you know, should be a little bit more physiological because they're mediated by synaptic connectivity. Um, and so we see, and our the effect, the tasks that we use are 
really classic hippocampal dependent tasks, paired associate memory, things like that, that don't really involve much uh, parietal lesions don't really affect performance in those tasks at all. Um, but whereas hippocampal lesions do. And so, um, so I think that's a, a, a potential issue to take into account is sort of, you know, how the network is affected and whether the effects are locally disruptive or dis or, you know, distributed uh, enhancements can will impact what kinds of ta aspects of cognitive function can be changed. And the final questions regarding the Theta Burst protocol. How long lasting are effects and is it problematic to record MRI or EEG after the stimulation? Um, well, um, so single, you know, some, a lot of the studies we've run use single session theta burst where we do, you know, 40 seconds of continuous theta burst and then pop people into the MRI scanner right afterwards. And that's trivial. You know, it's easy to shuttle somebody into the MRI scanner as long as your stimulator is close by. And the effects last some amount of time. <laughs> I won't, I don't know the, the exact time course. We try to keep things within an hour, our tasks, and we often look at the time course and we see that, you know, there often is a reduction of an effect over the course of blocks within the within that period of time but the time course is going to depend entirely on the task and the region what you're measuring you know and, and what, what your assay is um, and so it's some amount of time you know somewhere maybe around an hour or maybe it's longer i don't know um, for the experiments where we delivered brief trains so just two seconds of continuous theta burst while people were actually in the scanner um, yes that was uh technically challenging and in fact fMRI data was being acquired the entire time the TMS pulses were just uh, interleaved in short temporal gaps that were inserted between the EPI uh, excitation pulses and so the EPI sequence was actually being fired off at a theta frequency and we sandwiched in little bursts of stimulation in between the temporal gaps of the EPI slices so that we wouldn't cause any uh, significant artifact in the MRI images due to the TMS pulses being delivered. Same thing with beta frequency, the control condition, those EPI pulses were being fired off at 13 and a half hertz with very small temporal gaps and we put single pulses in between those. Um, and so it's a challenge to set up, but once you do set it up, you get pretty clean data um, without much, you know, artifact, at least for these, uh, you know, there's some constraints on what frequencies you could possibly use doing using that method because the EPI pulses can only go so fast or so slow. Um, but, uh, but within a range of possibilities, it's, you know, you get pretty decent data quality.